Hi, I'm Ida Echeverria of the Fullerton College Hornet, and I am sitting here with Mr. Tom Steyer, presidential candidate. Tom, <laughs> thank you very much for taking your time to sit down with us. We really appreciate it. Ida, it's a treat to be here with you. Thank you. The first question, uh, simple question. For our readers who may not know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for president. Well, I'm running for president for a simple reason, which is corporations have bought the government. The government's broken. It's not serving the people of the United States, and it hasn't been serving the people of the United States. And if we're going to get any of the things that people really want, whether it's affordable health care, quality public education, or a living wage, or clean air and clean water, we're going to have to break the corporate stranglehold on our government. And so that's why I'm running, because that is the issue. Not what do we want, because we all want the same things. We can argue about how to get them best. The real question is how are we going to get any of it, because this government is broken, it's not serving the people, and until it does, we're not going to get those things. Right. Um, you've said just now that government is failing our corporations. Um, failing our people. It's yeah, serving failing. the corporations. So, but because corporations have bought out the government. Right. But then how do you keep corporations accountable while still preserving the free market? So, you know, I started a business from scratch uh, probably at this point 33 years ago. Mm -hmm and built it up into a pretty big, big business. Then I took the giving pledge to give away at least half my money while I'm alive to good causes. Mm -hmm. And I started organizing coalitions of ordinary American citizens to take on unchecked corporate power. So I'm not a, I know we need a dynamic, competitive, innovative private sector. I also know they can't write the laws for, them, for, for their benefit against the interests of the United States. Yeah. So do I think we need drug companies? I know we need drug companies. Do I want drug companies charging us a hundred times for the same drug what they charge people in Australia? No, that's absolutely wrong. And I don't want them writing a law that says we can't go to foreign countries and buy the much cheaper drugs that they sell there. I want the government of the United States to represent the people of the United States, period, the end. And when we get that, we'll be back in a you know, decent shape. How does Wall Street respond to your idea of taking on the corporations? Well, I think that Wall Street is, it, look, they, to me, seem very sensitive about admitting what's going on. I proposed a wealth tax over a year ago, long before I was running for president, because I felt like the inequality in this country is unacceptable, it's undemocratic, and it's unsustainable, that it will cause a huge, it's already causing immense pain, and it will cause a huge, it will really end democracy if we keep going this way. But if you've noticed over the last few days, a bunch of very rich Americans have been complaining that they're being unfairly targeted in terms of money. And it's kind of like, and your question was, how does Wall Street feel? You know, apparently they feel very sensitive. I, I know that President Obama called people on Wall Street fat cats one time and they practically had a heart attack. It's like, excuse me? So I try not to pay too much attention to that. My attitude on this whole thing is, I want to figure out the right thing to do. I want to stand up and fight for the American people. And that's the way it's going to go. And if people push back, I'll listen. I'll try and see how much of it I think is credible and how much of it I think is self-serving. And then I'll keep trying to do the right thing. Why do you think a wealth tax is the way to combat economic inequality over other methods like a value-added tax or estate taxes? It's not that I'm opposed to, for instance, estate taxes. Mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to estate taxes. It's just I think that something has happened in this you know, country where, first of all, the income inequality has gotten so dramatic that I'm for rolling back all of the tax cuts on rich people and big corporations. But more than that, if you, there's the income inequality, then there's the wealth inequality that's even much, much, much more dramatic and which really has been a reallocation to the richest Americans over the last 40 years. I think a wealth tax, we need the money to support systems, but also we're talking about the richest one-tenth of one percent, one out of a thousand Americans. Kind of, it, it, it's not something that, I think it's just, I think it's fair, I think it's necessary. Do you think that government should be run like a business? No. Look, government is all about values. It's all about figuring out what the value, what the va what values you take more, most seriously and focusing on making sure they're lived out. So that, that's justice, equity, freedom, um, treating people as full human beings, 
you know, the deepest values. Business, you run business on an efficiency basis with, I mean, if you look at businesses, they really measure themselves overwhelmingly in terms of profits, profitability and the value that the market assigns to them. Those are not, that's not right for if you're running, it's totally different. The question in, in running a government is, what are the values you stand up for? How does the society organize itself? Not on the bottom line. The Democratic Party is currently divided between the progressives and the moderates. Which vision do you think would better serve the country? Well, first of all, I'm not sure exactly where that dividing line would fall. I think of myself as a progressive, but I'm clearly someone who knows we need a vibrant, competitive, innovative private sector, for instance. But I'm also someone who's for a wealth tax. I'm for someone who's rolling back all those taxes. I know we need affordable health care as a right for every American. So when I think about the differences in terms of moderate and progressive Democrats, it's not a question of what we're trying to accomplish. I think we all agree about what we're trying to accomplish. We're arguing about what's the most effective way to get there. You know, the most effective and fair way to get there. And so in, in most of those things, I think I fall on the progressive side, but I'm not a doctrinaire pro progressive. And I think I'm someone who, you know, absolutely does understand prosperity and growth and the need for it. And, I, you know, that isn't either. You know, I think of myself as a very different person from most of the people running for virtually everybody. I'm an outsider in the political system. I've been working in the political system full time. I'm not scared to change the political system. And I have a much different sense. So I'm willing to talk about term limits and national referendums. And I'm also someone who knows a lot more about how the world works economically, I think, than people who've really never been out in the, in the business world and you know, competed in, around the world. What is your vision for America's future? A country that continues to be involved in a global stage or one that focuses on domestic policy? I don't think there's any way that America isn't involved in the global stage. I, I, I think that that's, it's just completely unrealistic. You know, if you think about it, one of the things I've said is I'd make climate my first priority. Global problem it demands a global solution. No one can solve that inside their own borders, including specifically the United States of America. Economics. We live in a global economy at this point. There's no way to build a wall around the United States and keep everybody out. It, it, it's, it's a fantasy. So we're going to have to live in the world. We're going to have to interact in the world. We're going to have to be a value-driven country with allies and coalitions to do the right thing. There's no, cho there's no second choice. What is your stance on military intervention? Look, I know that we need military intervention to protect the lives and vital interests of Americans. But I believe in diplomacy first, long before that. And I think that watching, I think we've been too quick to move to military action. I think we've been too quick to move to unilateral military action without coalition partners. And I think if you look, I think you should be very, very careful about committing the lives of American service people to a conflict unless you understand completely the mission, the goals, how you can accomplish them, and how to connect. All right, let's change the subject a little bit. Public impeachment proceedings have begun this week. With the country still divided, what do the American people have to gain from impeachment? Well, as you know, I started the Need to Impeach movement over two years ago. Um, what we have is to stand up for the system and to stand up for the health and safety of Americans. We have the most corrupt president in American history. He seems to feel that the laws of America don't apply to him. We can't, you know, that's a very, very bad statement for a country. You know, believing in the role of law, understanding that everybody is subject to the law, that we, everybody's accountable, is critical to the system. So the idea that it doesn't matter, that it is a terrible thing. And so I believe that if he was a corrupt president two years ago, I think it's become, I think everybody now knows, the Republicans know it, everybody knows he's corrupt. Everybody knows he covers it up. The question is, what do you want to do about it? And I've said all along, Corruption at the heart of a system is like a rot. It spreads. And so you can't let it spread. You've got to oppose it. And I've been opposing it for two years. And I think now people have, more than 8 million people signed our petition, the need to impeach petition. 
And I think now people at Washington DC is caught up in there saying all the things we were saying two years ago almost word for word. All right, we have time for one last question. Between climate change, economic inequality, and rising living costs, people are worried about the future. A lot of young people are worried about the future. How would your presidency ensure that young people have a secure future? Well, I believe, look, first of all, I've said climate is my number one priority. I'm the only person who said that. I'm unequivocal about it. But I also believe it's our number one opportunity. And I believe that in solving climate, we can create millions of good paying union jobs everywhere in the United States. I believe we can clean up our air and water, particularly in the low income communities and the black and brown communities where the air is unsafe to breathe and the water is unsafe to drink. I believe we can lead the world again. We can reinvent ourselves as a country by solving the biggest problem in the world. So when you talk about income inequality, I think this is a way to address it. When you talk about a divided country, I think this is a way to address it. And by the way, we have to address it anyway. So to me, it's all one big ball of wax. If we attack our biggest challenge, we also create our biggest opportunity. We also deal with our other huge problems, including specifically inequality on multiple spectrums. And so to me, that's the first thing we've got to do. And if we do that successfully, we'll reinvent this country in a very good way. Well, thank you very much, Tom. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thank I you know. for visiting Fullerton College. We would love to see you again soon. Thank you for having me. It's a treat to be here. Thank you very much.